one and all, and welcome back to another exciting episode of Adventuring Academy, Dimension 20's podcast, where we talk about all things gaming and tabletop and how to play and what different theories and practices work the best at your table and tables all over. Thank you so much for tuning in. Oh my gosh, everybody. Today, I am so excited for the incredible guest who's going to be here talking with us about all things tabletop. You know her work. She is an animation TV writer for My Little Pony, Equestria Girls, Final Space, and Mau Mau Heroes Pure of Heart. Uh, Heroes of Pure Heart. Uh, she's also a dungeon master. You've seen her dungeon mastering on Girls Guts Glory, uh, which is streamed from Wizards of the Coast. And you also uh, can find her musical that she wrote and directed, Starry the Musical, available on Spotify right now, as well as an upcoming project, which is going to be incredible, and d and an all-native D&D actual play show coming soon to a live stream near you. We are so excited to have her here on the show. Please give it up for Kelly Lynn D- Angelo! Yes, ba- woo! The crowd goes wild. I, I blush. I grab all the stuffed animals and flowers that you throw to me on my mental ice skating ring. <laughs> <laughs> Flowers, flowers, flowers. <laughs> Kelly, it is so wonderful and an honor for us to have you on the show today. Thank you so much for making the time to come by. For having me, Brennan. It's it's really exciting to be here. I, I am honored to be among this amazing list of folks you've had on your show and also getting the chance to talk with you. It's just, it's really exciting. So thanks for having me. Oh, I'm so, so glad. Thank you so much. Um, uh, We're going to start. Normally we do like a half hour of conversation and then move into questions. Kelly, uh, you actually got a question that is not even a question. I just wanted to start with it. The person (laughs) says it's not a question. Um, This is from one of our Discord users, uh, Turbo Man. And it was just so sweet that I had to start right away with it. Kelly Lynn, you and Joey Clift have been incredible voices for Native representation and entertainment. No question. Just wanted to express my appreciation for everything you do. Uh, so a little Thank bit of... Thank you so much. Thank you, Turbo Man. Sorry <laughs> to cut you off. This is so thoughtful. <laughs> very, very lovely. We put up on our Discord that you were going to be coming on the show to get some questions. And uh, uh, we just had that lovely uh, a compliment right out of the gate. Um, Kelly, talk to me a little bit about um, you, uh, your love for tabletop, where it started, uh, what your journey beginning into tabletop RPGs started as and where it brought you. Yeah, so it's been an interesting journey for me. Um, I'm from upstate New York. I'm from Rochester. My whole family's from Buffalo. So if you throw pretty much like a dart at somewhere in upstate New York, I have been from there, families from there, I've lived there, or I know it too well. That is just my experience. But growing up in upstate, especially if you're from around there in you know, with the dynamicism that my family had as well on both sides, um, there's not much to do. You, you're kind of, um, you know, you got your local, you know, if you're lucky within, you know, walking distance, I wasn't as lucky, but you have your movie theater, um, and you have the outdoors, you have air and water and food on the table. And that, I'm trying to think of what else you have. You, you, there's other stimuluses, but they're further away. You have to have a car, but generally speaking, it's a quaint life and it's pretty simple. And I had always, as a young girl, stretched the borders and wanted more. I always felt I had, I think I was just hyperactive. I mean, there's a lot of things we can dive into on that, but I've always had a lot of energy and I still do kind of to this day. So when I was really young, I was really, really active. I was dancing all the time. I was doing tons of extracurriculars, but I, it also put me into this weird space as a young child where I was kind of like a weird one. I was not just you know, the black sheep in my school, but kind of the black sheep in the family. I was reading at an advanced level. I was studying a lot. I wanted to learn a bunch of things. And I was just kind of weird. And it led to me kind of searching for this sense of belonging or the sense of community or comfort, especially exercising how overactive my mind was with storytelling. Um, Did I play with Barbie dolls until I was 13? Did I play with Legos till I was 13? Did I give every single toy car that my family let me inherit? Um, Did I give them front stories and back stories and give them names and create like a teen drama with every single toy car that I ever had? The answer to all of these things are yes. (laughs) And it led to me not having a lot of friends, which is fine. I was a young girl who didn't want to have to dumb herself down 
and didn't want to have to pretend to be anything than what and who I was, which led to having to need a lot of self-awareness and self-resilience, which kind of brought me into a community theater <laughs> because that was a great place to storytell and explore and be creative and let all of that extra energy that I had in out. And hilariously enough, um, community theater in upstate New York, uh, be it being kind of my out, is also what led me to Dungeons and Dragons. Kind of a weird connect, but I swear it makes sense because being, being one of the few people who was kind of, kind of on the outskirts of everything, you know, I'm native. I didn't feel like I fit in. My mascot for a long time growing up was the Indians. So I just like lived in a world where I just didn't see myself. And I tried to find friends nearby who felt like they understood what it felt like to be the other. And you find that in community theater, especially in a very quaint city, very small, very suburban, very white neighborhood that doesn't really embrace people who maybe have different um, interests and different partners or LGBTQ to uh, us, you know, like mm -hmm. the whole spectrum. So while I was kind of navigating that, I found some people within the community theater space who were gay, who I was my closest friends and they were actually the first people to kind of after one day after rehearsal um one of them pulled me aside and whispered hey do you it was like this hey do you want to do something that i know you shouldn't do and i just turned to them and i'm just like what are you thinking like are we playing a video game are we playing grand theft auto like what's going on and <laughs> like how risky are we going and he turns to me and he goes, no, um, I'm a dungeon master. And I think you'd really enjoy playing D&D &D with me. Um, his name is Nick. He's wonderful. He lives in San Fran now. And I was just like, you know what? Let's get some of our friends together and do it. I want to play. And he's like, you grew up really, really Catholic. Like, don't tell your mom. And I'm like, you don't understand. I don't tell my mom a lot of things. Like, <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll all play at the table secretively together. Because I only knew this. I only understood it as a satanic panic. And I kind of grew up with it, you know, kind of being this hidden thing that nobody should talk about much like being, you know, uh, by myself and things like that. So there was a lot of hidden stuff, uh, but D&D had like helped so much because we sat around the table. It was the weirdest group of players in the world who were all eccentric community theater kids. And we played and that first taste when I was 15 or 14, I, I was very young. That first taste that I got, I was like, oh my goodness, I want more. And so we got the chance to play a few other times during some rehearsals. Uh, but then eventually that led, once the show, the community show was over, it led to us not playing as consistently together because we couldn't get all the rides from our parents. <laughs> and um, um, I just hungered for it, hungered for it, hungered for it all throughout college, asking people, whispering it in the shadows of Syracuse Halls underneath Hendrix Chapel. Do you play D and D? I was at parties, and when I would overhear someone say D and D, I, my head would whip around, and I would like to toe over and ask if they played. People will say that I did this. Um, it, it was a real thing. And thankfully, once I moved out to LA right after graduating Syracuse, one of my roommates was a dungeon master. So I got the chance to play with him a little bit more. But eventually, I realized I'm going to have to be a DM. There's just constantly hunting for a DM, constantly wanting to play. I need to start sort of rekindling that fire within me. But where do I even begin to talk? And I kid you not when I say I started, I was, I love YouTube. And I'm obsessed with it. Hey, college humor, obsessed with YouTube. You guys are great. Um, I, I'm not upset that you guys didn't hire me as an intern back in 2011. We won't talk about that. Um, uh, but, but when I was like, I just love YouTube. And I was constantly typing into the search engine, D&D &D gameplay, D&D &D gameplay. Found the Yogg's cast doing it a little bit, still wanted more. And eventually one day this thing called Critical Role popped up. and I was able to start talking about it to people because I could say, hey, have you seen this show? Have you seen it? And they're like, what? Are you talking about like Avatar The Last Airbender? Are you talking about like Riverdale? I'm like, no, it's a sh it's it's I'm not, I won't say it's even better because I don't know if any, a lot of my friends work on those shows, but like it's really good. It's just as good. <laughs> and so um, I started sharing that with them. And then lo and behold, I suddenly had players and I started exercising all of those skills just a couple weeks into critical role airing because I started watching the show and my passion was just reignited. And then the rest is kind of history. So 
Oh my God! What what a story! What a tale! Um, I I love too that you like. First, of, there's so many things that I want to shout out. First of all, uh, shout out to Upstate New York. Yeah, other than <laughs> other than getting milkshakes at Stewart's, there's not too much going. <laughs> Wegmans. Wegmans. Yeah. <laughs> all of the good dinosaur barbecue. Like there's so <laughs> many. Like, there's so many things. Just the landmarks of Upstate. But you know, you're very right that like. Um, that that uh, uh, God, the dependency on on rides. This like, oh, how do we get a ride? Um, also, the all of the the like late night diner runs because it's like there's no other place for us to even be physically in the world right now. Uh, oh yeah, the amount of the amount of uh, things that occurred within the family diners of like <laughs> they all hated us because we also showed up in glitter and costume and like I. Did I dress up for every Harry Potter movie before it was cool? I'm not saying that I didn't, but also remember, I was weird. Yes, 100%. Everyone knows the corner booth of a diner. We, it got to the point where there was like a back room to the New Paltz Plaza Diner where it's like these kids are going to come in. They're going to be covered in grease paint and glitter from LARPing. Just shove them in the back corner as far from the regular customers Dear God, but hey, you know what? We were we were reg we were regulars too. It's we supported the local the local diner. Yeah, uh, we only got it half off when it was you know four ninety nine for the boneless <laughs> buffalo wings. But like you know, that, we tipped well. We, we tipped, tipped at least at least twenty percent. It wasn't yeah. hard on four ninety nine, but we tipped twenty percent. A hundred percent. Yeah, nothing. We, it took us a, a thirty minutes to figure out the tip because a bunch of teenagers trying to do that math at three o'clock in the morning. But you know what? We're we're gonna we're gonna say we're gonna pat. You our know what? That's title. how I knew I was a dungeon master. I always took the receipt and I always broke it down, and I knew I was destined. So it was See, even before we played. <laughs> but that's what I want to talk about. Is it's such a beautiful thing. Like you're saying, there's this moment of. Um, of like, I think that a lot of dungeon masters have that awakening in themselves where they go like, man, I'm having a hard time finding a dungeon master out here. And then they have that little moment of being called to service of like, well, damn, if I'm having a hard time finding a dungeon master, I guess everyone else is too. You know, I'm, I'm looking around here. I'm not seeing anyone stepping up. I'm going to step up. Um, that's so wonderful um and talk to me a little so like your when was that first time that you were like i want to play and i want to play so badly that i will take the sort of onus on myself of starting a game getting players either getting a module or homebrewing my own campaign world like what was that process like the first time you were sitting down at the head of the table it was intimidating and I made a lot of mistakes. I'm not going to lie. Like I, I at first put the feelers out and was hunting for somebody online. And I was just like, Hey, can we connect? Like, cause we were all talking about it through some online groups. And I just reached out. I was like, Hey, like who can, who can do this? We have 15 people who want to play. Like, how do we make this happen? And then everyone was kind of dancing in circles. And I just said, you know what? I'll do it. Give me a month. Let me, let me work on this. I won't say it's going to be great right away or good in any capacity, but like, I want to start somewhere. And with that, I kind of went into like overachiever study mode. I was like an overachiever in high school. <laughs> I was, we don't have to talk about just how much of a nerd I was, but like when you have no friends, you put it into school and you take all of your lunch hours and study hall periods and you just fill it with classes. Mm -hmm. um, so um, I was one of those kids. So I was like, okay, Let's overachieve. So like, I just went in and I read, I read the manual over and over and over again. I watched as much online play as I could. I studied a lot and did a lot of resource work on Forgotten Realms because I thought to myself, you know, I'm not going to try to homebrew, but if I can master the Forgotten Realms and the lore and the history of it to essentially make it canonized within my own head, then I can apply that within the story and sandbox this in a way where there are certain things, but people can make choices and then I can kind of react and build from there. And it was a, definitely an experiment. It was a lot of stumbling as I began. And I actually started with fourth edition um, uh, modules built within 5e uh, mm -hmm. worlds because I liked the mechanics of 5e, but I think some of the 4e storytelling is so rich. And I yeah. really wanted to latch on to that and build from there so that one day I could step into the more updated storylines and really, you know, I don't know, um, embrace them and understand where they came from. So as I was kind of exercising all of that, I did make the 
the mistake of inviting the other 14 people to play for the first time. <gasps> no, Kelly. Yeah. Yes. You had you had 14 people playing at your first table? <gasps> any of them, that is true. Oh my god, that's beautiful and epic and also I feel so sorry for Kelly of a long time ago. That's a lot of work. I learned the hard way for a bit, but but it was also so exciting because I kind of understood how to spotlight people and balance different characters and needs. And eventually, you know, once we played every few weeks, some folks were like this, you know, this is a bit too much for me or like this. But we had our core group within like about a few months of playing. We had a normal like eight people playing. So yeah. <laughs> normal eight. <laughs> um, eight to seven people playing. And we played a game for almost a year and it was absolutely oh. magical. Uh, they made a lot of choices that were strong. And I learned as a DM that you can build so much. Oh, you can build the world. You can build the stories. But it's not about that. It is about <laughs> listening and reacting. And that was amazing. Also coming from improv, being able to implement all the skills and start to free myself and my narrative a bit more. Well, I love that too, because you are somebody who can really speak to the skill set of being a dungeon master because your career is this multi-talent career of you've written for animation, you've done improv, you've written musicals, you have a musical theater background. And I also love too, when you say the thing of like, like musical theater connecting to D&D, I know from a pop culture standpoint why that seems like a huge jump. But having played myself in the, coming from like a LARP background, yeah. that high drama, loving the loving of showmanship and entertainment mm. and storytelling for its own sake, I get 100% why those two links would come together. Um, so looking at, at in the constellation of types of storytelling and types of performance you have done, where do you see tabletop and Dungeons and Dragons sort of lying? Like, I love what you just said, like, because I, I've even said on the podcast before, like, um, sometimes I, I think that you want to avoid looking at that dungeon master position as a full-fledged storyteller because there is so much of it that actually is, um, you know, you don't want to veer into the auteur status that sometimes comes with that. Where do you see tabletop lying in the constellation of your other talents, performances, and mediums that you work in? It's storytelling and spe specifically within the TTRPG world, it's so, it is its own medium. It truly is. You know, I, you understand coming from improv backgrounds, coming from musical theater, each one of these are a tool for us to tell our stories or to tell stories together. But that together part is the most interesting part of it because in musical theater and pre you know prescripted writing animation live action things like that you know we come together and then we build the story and then we in invite others into it and we all sort of make it our world together that way with D, D, everyone's agency is a bit different uh the ownership is a bit different and the trust is so much more raw i really think if you can create a really beautiful experience at the table with a game, you can do anything. I, I think it's the most incredible tool, much like improv being such a phenomenal tool as well. I love improv because there are certain games you can implement, you can do all these different sorts of styles and mind melding with people and creating that comedy and those beats can, so much richness can come from that. So much freedom within yourself and others and really cool idea generation that you can kind of sink into and bring forward or character works for mm -hmm. actors. For D and D you can get that, but because of the rule set that is a bit more strict in ways, but I would just say that there's there's stronger rail there's a stronger railroad track to go down. And mm -hmm. you're still choosing whatever destination you want together. But you're building you're literally building the, the, the like you're building the actual train as you're as you're driving it. That's the difference. <laughs> like like everywhere else you got the train and you're going. You already know what your cargo is. With D and D you're just like building it together and you're kind of the conductor saying, Okay, we're going this okay. <laughs> oh we need more Oh gosh, can somebody please feed Tommy? He's dying. You know, <laughs> 
it's, it's kind of like that. And that's what makes it so special is that trust because you don't know where you're going, but you know, you're going somewhere. And if you can implement that style of storytelling and trust within one, one another with the gameplay, then you can, you can, that will carry over to other areas in your life. And it's, it's a skill set that I honestly like, and, and the reason why it's so enriching is because it's as real as a story that you, you know, tell on a 2D surface. Like you have these experiences together and you can talk with your friend, Brianna, and you can be like, Brianna, remember that time you slayed that dragon and like you licked the sword's blood and like, oh, it was just like, you remember that? And you can be like, yeah, while well, you're like at a wedding, you know, it's just, <laughs> it, that's the magic of it. That's the magic of Dungeons and Dragons in comparison to the other modes of storytelling. You're talking removed that's why musical theater and D&D are so close. You're inviting an audience in to share an experience, an emotional moment together. And in D&D, that fourth wall is removed. Like, you're all there and you're in it. Yes, that's an X. Right. Like, that, it's that idea of, it's like, you can put improv and, and tabletop together uh, and then take other things like writing, whether you're writing for comics, you're writing for television, you're writing a novel. Because I think that one of the main things, back, back when I was teaching improv, I would always say one of the hardest thing for artists coming from another medium to do when they get into improv is to remove your instinct to mm-hmm. to edit, mm-hmm. to, to go like, okay, can this be perfected? And it's very hard to, to have, especially in like, I've even said to people like, listen, I wrote, I was a game writer at a LARP camp for a long time. There are a lot of moments where as a writer, like sometimes I think within improv, there's this idea of like, never say no, never edit. That works for improv, but it doesn't mean that editing is bad. It's good to have a perfectionist spirit. If you're working on a script, it should be tight. You should have it be pretty polished and have it be good to go, right? This is only gonna exist one time. With improv and tabletop, you get into that similar sphere of, of, we are completely removing the instinct to alter. The first draft is the last draft. And we, instead of editing and perfecting and polishing, we are going to bring in this other thing where we perfect something by honoring it exactly as it happened. And that's how exactly. we're going to... That's how we're going to perfect it. But I love what you just said, because I think that is a difference for me between improv and... Um, and especially like a little bit different with actual play, but with the games is when you're doing improv, there's still always this idea of this is presentational. It's for yes. the audience, right? Yes. In tabletop, you and your friends at the table are the primary audience. And as a result of that, you're also doing this thing, which you're definitely not doing in long form improv, which is you are inviting a collaborator to the table that are these collections of pretty little polyhedral gemstone math rocks. (laughs) Yep. And and they're a collaborator with you, which unlike an improv means there is a a helper at the table with us who is gonna help us with this story that has no affiliation with human wants or desires. (laughs) It is just here to reflect chance and circumstance. Um, (laughs) Which makes the storytelling so thrilling because you realize that one of the storytellers is not moved by friendship with the other people at the table or human biases. It's like really anything can happen, Um, which is extremely dramatic and wonderful. Um, I wanted to also jump into something with you if I could, which was, um, so starting with with this amazing 14 person game, jumping into this (laughs) regular- Amazing is a strong word, I like it. (laughs) I just know for me, I don't know if our like our audience maybe has not run games personally. I I'm just thinking of the pure heft of getting that game. There's just nothing but respect for even successfully running a 14 person. That is a feat of creative strength and and stamina that I can only just thank uh, you, thank you. Um, but I wanted to ask too, um, the trans. So a lot of the guests that we've had on the on Adventuring Academy have come into D and D um, with sort of a like started two years ago, three years ago, four years ago. As someone who has been playing this game um, uh, since adolescence, much like me, that you start, you found it when you were high school age, when you were a teenager. Um, what has 
what has been your experience watching the like ascendancy of not only D and D but all these tabletops and actual play as a performance genre? What has that been like for you? I mean, oh gosh, absolutely freeing, <laughs> freeing because because it was always something that I felt I didn't I never feel like shame is not something I want to feel ever, but I felt like I had to be quiet about it. Like it's something that wasn't that's something that I could be judged about, like I could be judged on. And that was hard for me, especially being a woman and being native. Like I just I, you're treading on thin ice already. And, and the idea of having to get bullied more or having to deal with people's energies more when you're just like, this isn't helping anybody. You're not, this is not conducive. Why, why are we, why are you judging me? This is, this energy is better spent on like maybe on yourself, <laughs> you know, like where, where is this going from? You know, I, I was just tiptoeing more and hoping and praying that there, it would have its day. It would have its moment, its freedom. And to see it kind of become this wave of it's a it's more than just a game for a lot of people like when you're playing a standard game and, and you're just I don't know at a, around a gaming table playing a million of t you know board games that I have which I'm also obsessed with and I, I love deeply um it gives you a totally different feeling than that of TTRPG and it's kind of like you get hungry for it because you're realizing you can be anything you want. There is a limitlessness to it. For those of us who grew up and were kind of enjoying all of these amazing fantasy stories that kind of hit us during the growth years, um, you know, the retellings like Lord of the Rings and Harry Potter and all of these monolithic things, um, holding on to those and then saying, wait a minute, I can paint this in my own head with my friends and I can be anything I want to be in my head and I can make choices i can play a guy and oh i can be a gnome um you just like have these moments that you're kind of able to grab onto and seeing people instead of shying away from it and lean into it it's an awakening you know yeah. and it's a it's not even it's like a renaissance in some ways but i actually i coined this term for myself from a young age and i call it a naissance which just means birth in french mm -hmm. because it's not even a rebirth of old ideals. What we're doing is we're birthing something completely new with the tools that we're given currently. And you're still still paying homage and respect to what once existed, but now we're making it for like everybody. Yeah. And it's beyond just the game. It's a tool for friendship. It's a tool for um closenessness. Closenessness? Closeness. Yeah. I, I, there's a lot of nesses in that one. Just add a few more. <laughs> um, it's it's become its own genre, its own thing, rather than just lumped into one of the many board games that you pick up when you go to a board game cafe. Um, and I can only see it growing and being used, hopefully, in every country around the world and maybe high schools having that be implemented during, you know, study halls or using it at lunch tables or using it for children who are trying to exercise their emotions and need to get it out in a conducive and healthy way. Kids like me who played with Barbie dolls till they were 13 and were judged for it. You know, mm -hmm. I could have used it. So, yeah. yeah. Oh, I, I love that. And yeah, I hear you. It's very, well, it's, it's great. I feel like I had a, 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 I also, I feel like I was like, I was incredibly like I was up in those double digit years of age when I was like, look, it's time to, just say what we're all thinking. Santa Claus probably is not real. You know, like, oh, <laughs> I, I'm not going to, I won't qualify it as a certainty, but it seems to be that he's probably not real. But the, I think that there is that, um, there is that beautiful thing of how freeing the game can be. And I also love what you said too, that th there are pieces of media that I have consumed passively that changed my life. However, the pieces of media that I had not only consumed, but been involved in the creation of them while I was consuming them, these stories that you create and perceive with your friends, because there's something beautiful about being a creator at the table while you're also still being a spectator, that mm -hmm. someone in their own private scene rolls that nat 20 and the whole table of friends bursts from their seats and, ah, I can't believe it. It's this beautiful 
shared thing where you it, it's like circular breathing. You are simultaneously being told a story and telling a story, and it's just beautiful. It's life changing. And like you said, you know, you're at a wedding somewhere, and then you turn and you're like, you and I might be like wearing suits right now. We killed a basilisk, and it's a huge deal, and it's crazy <laughs> that no one's talking about it. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> Um, uh, it's beautiful. And we, uh, 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 a player on Dimension 20, uh, Emily Axford, who's an incredible D&D player, she has often said, like, like what you, an, an echo of what you just said of these memories being fictional don't live in a different part of your heart than your first person real world memories. Like, yes, it's a story, but I remember the dread as the dice was rolling in my hand and remember the relief when it hit that number it needed to hit. Mm -hmm. And it is a first person story, even for being fictional. And you remember those moments, they really, really shape you. Um, it's so beautiful and enriching. Um, I wanted to also talk about, uh, uh, speaking of those first person storytellers, uh, I want to talk a little bit about the awesome actual plays you've been involved in. Oh, Girls, yes, please. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> uh, Girls Guts Glory, an incredible actual play. I've, you know, this is like, I've, I remember seeing you guys up in the news. It's a stream that everybody should check out if you haven't already. Kelly is an incredible DM. And I also wanted to talk about NDND, which has not appeared yet. No, not but, yet. Not yet. <laughs> But, oh, baby, does it sound incredibly exciting. Um, talk a little bit about your journey with, like, moving from uh, a dungeon master into, like, a in-front-of-camera dungeon master and what that was like. It was a really special experience. Uh, girls Goods Glory, they are my girls. They are my heart. Um, and we are – and the beautiful thing is, too, is that everybody within it is so talented. Right now, Rachel uh, Seely is running their current – uh, their current sort of season and it's incredible just because if you can't tell I'm doing way too much at the moment <laughs> and I'm going to be returning uh, down the line um, but being able to be a part of their collective be a part of their group has a really unique and interesting beginning just because I was just playing <laughs> Dungeons and Dragons trying to get become this better storyteller with 14 people and ended up running this game for a year and exercising and, and getting becoming the best DM I possibly could you flash forward a couple years later I ended up meeting somebody by sheer luck uh, at an event who happened to work at Geek and Sundry, and they invited me to come hang out on Friday nights, which is how I know uh, Erica Ishii and Steph Lidburn and all these uh, amazing love people. love Erica. Yes. I know. I love Erica, too. And that's where I met these two girls who had just happened to be there the same night. And we were talking, and um, they mentioned out of the blue, like, oh, yeah, we're looking for a new DM. And I said, I'm a dungeon master and I've never played with all women. You guys sound really cool. Like, can we play? And they said, yeah, let's do it. And so I brought them over to my house with that beautiful table that I hand built with all of my friends. Um, I do, I'm very proud of the table. Richard Coiner built a beautiful table and uh, shout, shout outs to Richard. Um, but there's this table and they sat around and I told this story that I've always you know, I got to exercise a little bit of a different part of me sitting down at that table with all women. It just, I had never had that feeling and it just changed it. It just changed the moment for me because I said, oh, I'm going to breathe a little bit easier here. Like knowing some stuff, just knowing that my former teams love, I love them to pieces, but maybe they're going to play differently. Maybe they're going to think differently. Maybe they're going to want to do certain things differently by approaching stuff. And it was true. Like they, they wanted to do more talking. They kind of wanted to do more of the role playing. And I said, this is so exciting. Like, let's keep leaning into this. And lo and behold, that first day we all played afterward, they're like, we got to keep you. You're joining our team. We're a part of Girls Guts Glory. We have one season that exists already. We're a thing that exists. Do you want to join us? And I was just like, yes, <laughs> yes. Like that's how it kind of happened. Um, magic uh sheer magic and from there i got to play with the women and i got to, i was so nervous when i first started i just i never live streamed and um as a dm you know i was shaky in the first few episodes i was so nervous um but eventually i sunk into it and found the pattern and was able to introduce the storyline and it was so engaging seeing the way they reacted to the storytelling and the characters of the world and i just i am so proud to be a part of their legacy and be a part of who and what 
these women are and have them in my life. I mean, one of them is one of my closest friends. Like we all, like it's, it's been a beautiful experience. They are my sisters. Um, that then relays to, you know, me joining the second sister, but as a player, which was totally different for Sirens of the Realm, uh, playing as Failure with Teen, which was, which is still and was incredible, uh, but it's very different coming from a player's perspective. And I kind of wanted to swing back into the DM space, you know, after running a couple of games like Tales from the Loop and um, uh, doing a few things with GNS, I said, you know, what, what am I missing? Because Girl Scouts Glory gave me so much by letting me sit at a table and, and constantly letting me play with these. What, like, what am I? I was like, you know what? I w- I've always wanted a table full of Indi- Indians. <laughs> um, what a beautiful thing. And I'm gonna, I am gonna. want to do it. And how do I do it? I, I just will it into the world. So I just contacted some of my friends who I had met over the years who are incredible comedians and insane writers people who should be household names. The, these people should be recognized by people because we don't have that. Our community doesn't have that. Our community needs representation more than ever because quite literally we're not represented anywhere correctly pretty much uh, 99% of the time unless we write our own stories. So what could it start to look like? I was like, well, let's start with D&D. Let's start in a space where there's no money and there's no there's no person above saying no. There's no there's no regulations. And I, we can just take this multi-million dollar budget in our heads and these characters that we want to build what, however we want. And we can play at a table and we can exist together. So that way we simply say we exist. Um, we've only met together a couple of times to build our characters. But it has been like I want to cry after we play because it's so it's so moving and it's so powerful for me uh, to see this this healing and see this beauty and celebrate what we are. It's just, I never thought I would see it. And um, I just hope we see more and more of it. I hope it creates a space for more people to be recognized. I'm going to get choked up thinking about it. Yeah. It's Um, hard. I'm not as articulate when I talk about it because I'm like, Oh, emotions. (laughs) (laughs) It sounds, it sounds, I mean, it seems completely correct to get choked up over it. It sounds beautiful. I cannot wait to support the stream. It's, and it's chaotic. They're all chaos. It's so chaotic. Like, like I think one or two of them are like, you guys, maybe we shouldn't. And then they're all like, wow. <laughs> <laughs> Jumping on the table, singing songs. Just, oh, God. That's... It's, be- it's beautiful, though, because they're all new players. I get, I, they get to, I get to guide them on this bond with the skills that I have with this lack of judgment and give them this tool and the space to, it, it's just, it's so, I hope to God one day we can bring this, the creator and God himself, all of them <laughs> mixed together. I hope we can bring this to, um, to reservations and to kids on the res who like could use a little bit of positivity and storytelling and, freedom within those spaces that we're receiving so let's echo that everybody let's let's get some kids on reses some books of dnt let's mobilize (laughs) (laughs) that is so beautiful and i think uh yes uh if you're watching this uh any dimension 20 fans uh uh, i'm not i'm not sure when when this episode will come out uh, uh, in relation to uh, when NDND is going to be coming out, uh, you are honor bound if you watch Dimension Twenty to go check out <laughs> NDND. Honor bound. Oh. I, I I will it as as Kelly has willed through the table and through Girls Got Glory and through all these willing of things to be. I will all of you. Please go check out this stream ASAP. Um, but what you're saying is really beautiful because there. It's one of those things where look. Like, like, I don't want to be overly romantic because the truth is that some people take these games and um, uh, some people take these games and tell stories with it that are not deeply self-affirming of souls and values and yada yada. Yeah, they just Pl- be fun. Yeah, they just yeah, do, pl- do, yeah. Plenty of people who pick it up and they're like, "Excuse me, I would like to kill some gorgons, thank you," and then check out. And if that's what you get out of it, then uh, you know, all the best. But. There is something in tabletop gaming that is so deeply and profoundly life affirming and affirming of something. And I think, I don't Welcome think there's. To storytelling. That's the native. That's, we are. 
the OG. We're the original storytellers. We are the people on Turtle Island who began the stories. We we tell stories orally. We sit around my tribe, sat around uh, fire, you know, within the winter season, and we would talk with the longhouses and we would share the stories. And those stories are just as real and just as enriching as D and D. And so to 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 see other people doing it, you know, it's it's like you're doing what we do. Like welcome, like how <laughs> is it? Like. <laughs> right? It's great. It's incredible. You're absolutely right. A hundred percent. And there is a beautiful invitation, especially when you can create a table. And what you're saying is it, you're talking about freedom, right? Because having a table of all women invites freedom, invites freedom to play, as you're saying, with a certain amount of like breathe out, exhale. Like there's, there is, yeah. you know, like, and I can, like, I can, again, I can only imagine, but the power of having that table and set up in that way to be like, we're going to tell this type of story and you can be as free as possible. And again, passive consumption of storytelling has definitely had life-changing impacts oh, yes. for me, but there is some, I, I think like when you talk about the, the explosion, the naissance, if you will, of this type of, of storytelling, into the public sphere, I think, yes, you can, there's a couple things you have to credit, which is like the lowered barrier for entry of podcasting and live streaming. That's definitely a part of it. Yeah. The success of actual plays like Critical Role is a huge part of it and bringing it to people. But I do, uh, there's a little romantic part of me that says like in a time period in which um, there are large forces at work asking you to confirm your identity, through your kind of allegiance to, you know, uh, like certain, like your passive consumption of certain things, be it music or pop culture or whatever. And again, yes, there are a lot of games that are themselves brands, but the story you create at the table is unique to you yeah. and your friends. And I think that there is something really powerful about the ability to be like, yes, 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 we love these stories, but also you and I know that we share a story that is ours and ours alone and we made it together. Um, mm -hmm. There's something really powerful about that. Um, when you are sitting down to create a story, whether it was, you know, during the seasons of Girls Cause Glory that you DM'd, or whether it's now as you are doing character creation and gearing up to launch this new NDD, &D, mm -hmm. um, uh, do you find your prep like this is I think a great question for people? Oh, I love this. I love how specific this is. Yeah. Yeah, like because we have a lot of viewers who might be gearing up to DM for the first time, or maybe they're going to go for a table of like all women, or they're gearing up for a table that there is a specific viewpoint. There is going to be a freedom at that table. What is some what, like? How do you approach your prep work? um vis-a-vis -vis these different games that you've actually played that's it's such a great question because that's where it all begins right it's like okay so what's the what's the catalyst what does it what's going to start the storytelling and what's going on in the world that is pre uh, prevalent or needs to be addressed at some point even if you're sandboxing or if you're doing like a straight story you know how do they interweave and how how do how do we build this together and that's Again, the word together is where I always start. I start with not myself and my own stories, but I start by listening to what they're doing. So it's never me at first, like maybe I'll, I'll choose a world at least, or maybe I'll choose like a general location to start. Um, but that's about as far as I go. Uh, I'll wait to begin a kind of generic quest maybe where they can kind of buff up and get some cool trinkets. But what I'm really doing is listening to how they navigate and the sort of stories they're sharing with one another. I want their front stories and their back stories. I want that session zero. So that way I can plan out the world kind of around them, um, yes. which is a little insane for some people, but I think that is way more engaging to you know, why make it some villain when you can make it the ex-husband of the palace? <laughs> like, yes, <laughs> you are preaching the true gospel. This is exactly what our, if you're listening to this, this is like, I think this is absolutely on the money. Building your story as an affirmation of what your pieces have already chosen 
develops a world that as your PCs explore it, they will feel innately connected to because it's based off of their choices. Um, a hundred percent. And I love what you said too about like not giving to like I think exactly what you're saying. You give them a world, but that's kind of to use the see if you can follow this is a weird metaphor, excuse me. But like it's almost like a conductor giving a key. Like we're all gonna be in this key, but I'm not gonna, you know, like I don't know what instruments you're bringing yet. Yeah. I'm just gonna give yeah. you this. <laughs> and then we'll figure out what's happening. And this is maybe a terrible musical analogy, but um, uh, but there's that idea of I'm going to give you a little tone setting, a little bit of here's kind of a loose idea to inspire so that you're not just making your character off of a blank page. And then after that, we're going to really get into the nitty gritty together. Um I think that's beautiful. Um, so, so launching into that, uh, uh, that idea of like incorporating your players' choices. Um, uh, what are the type of choices that players make to get you really excited? Like, what are the things that they do, and you're like, great, like ex-husband for the paladin, got it. I love it when they make mistakes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and if they don't make mistakes, I love it when the dice rolls make it for them. Like I. <laughs> I think the best story comes from flawed characters. I, you know, I try to explain this to people sometimes when I say, don't be afraid. There's no winning in D&D. So, so don't be afraid to let your character's flaws determine and have results because that's where really rich storytelling will come out. When you, when you watch something like Riverdale, are you watching it for all the outside characters that come in that die off in one episode? No, you're watching it for the drama between Veronica and Archie and Betty. You know, like you want that juice. You want that drama. You want them to make bad choices. Well, they won't. Like you want all that. And to set that up, you know, the freedom of saying, don't be afraid to do things like splitting the party if it makes sense. Don't be afraid to not to do things and story tell when the other characters are aware they can't hear that or they don't actually know what's going on. You know, there's a certain level of trust as we go around the table to kind of stretch into those arenas. I, I remember there was one of my favorite moments was a few years back, one of our druids, uh, uh, his name was Leaf. Um, he was just wading through some murky waters, some swamps, and uh, they had killed um, a homebrew version of a shambling mound. And they're going through this, and they killed it. And as you know, a shambling mound it turns into a twig that's enchanted that eventually grows again. So uh, he doesn't like to see plant and earth things destroyed. So after they destroyed the shambling mound, he ate it. Oh. <laughs> as an octopus <laughs> and that meant that the rest of that session I had to google the interior of an octopus because who needs chambers or, or, or actual dungeons when you have the inside of an octopus to go through so yes essentially it was like an eye honey I shook the kids where everybody had to like oh my god <laughs> all characters through a giant octopus to try to find the shambling mound sticks so that way yeah so that was like one of the best characters that like like what a character moment like what a great character moment that ended up being one of the best sessions ever because of a flawed character making a strong choice god that's so good but what i want to underline there too is there's something in there's there's something in that scene you've described that is a perfect you know, e.g. for what dungeon masters need to do. Because there's two things, that, there's a balance, right? Mm -hmm. Enforce consequences, because consequences are storytelling. Like something happened and it led to something else. It's not a sequence of random events, it's a sequence of events that follow as the journey continues, right? Right. The, the step follows the step immediately preceding it. And so it's it's consequences which we need, but there has to be playfulness. There yeah. has to there has to be <laughs> playfulness because one thing is that I think is a holdover of a cr crunchier, l less um, kind spirited holdover from incarnations of the game in the distant past, which would be like consequences are a moment 
to play gotcha and deeply punish your players. Yeah, yeah, I get that. Yeah. Which, which is the thing that you have to balance because I think I think that it's very possible there is a golden mean here because yeah. on the one hand there is like a oh you ate the twig the shambling mound blows up in your stomach and now you're a dead now you're a, a big patch of mulch you dumb octopus how dare you right <laughs> and then the other the other half is the thing of like oh you eat the twig cool you eat the twig nothing happens it's yes. all okay yes. Which, as you can see, is maybe very kind, but what does it do? It doesn't create story. And there's something beautiful about, like, I am going to hold you to your action. You've eaten an enchanted twig. This was maybe ill-advised. But what is the cure for this ill-advised thing? More story! More story is the cure, which is, like, the exact perfect example of, I think, how to satisfy both those desires in storytelling. And I think that's, um, uh, to look at that uh, another way as well, is that thing, because I think what the downsides are to both paths are, if everything is always okay, the story loses its stakes and your yeah. players begin to go like, you know, like sometimes when you push on the world, what you want is resistance. You, you do, yes, 100%. Yeah. Like that's what they want to feel, like. I have had so many sessions with players coming in and they've had a bad day and they say, I got to kill something today. You know what I do? I look at my notes and I say, they're going to kill something today. Like I, kill, like, like I do it. I do it for them. You know, like they don't need to know that. I hope they're not listening, but mm -hmm. also I'm going to do it for them because oh. if, like that is true. Like there need, there needs to be that pushback. There needs to be that resistance. There, there needs to be that feeling of, I can do it. I did it sometimes. It's very yeah. important. A hundred percent. And I love that feeling. And, and but the thing in like, if you go too far in the other direction, you end up with these moments of like, let's say someone eats the twig and you just kill them, right? What you have done that, I think the important thing is, is there is a, almost like a mirroring, like a dance exercise between dungeon master and players. Mm -hmm. If you show for them because a dungeon master is fundamentally like a physics engine and also a consequence engine for the world if you show them like hey you ate the twig you did you did like a fun big choice check this out you're dead now don't be surprised when the next adventure rolls around and you go like you know, a robed stranger invites you into a gothic carriage and says, I have a proposition for you. And all your players go, we shoot him. No, nope, don't trust him. He's bad. We don't listen to the stranger. In fact, we run. I wild shape into a bird. I fly. <laughs> and you're going like, how can I, how come my PCs won't take my adventure hooks? And they're like, they won't take them because you've been too, you're not playful. Yes. There was the, the break of trust. There's the breaching of trust, which is so delicate. And, you know, I think that there's also sometimes the stigma that people shouldn't like talk about it. And I think the healthiest tables do talk about it. Like, let's say you do make one of those choices. You know, there's so many options, so many choices with this twig situation that it could have gone so many different directions. And if a choice or a mistake is made, like that's where the real discussion begins. That's where the real trust is made outside of the table, around the table saying, hey, you guys, I made this bad choice. I'm going to modify it. Can we talk about it? You know, like that, no, no person is perfect. I've had to have those moments where I've, pulled people aside. I said, Hey, are you okay? What's going on? And we've, we've talked through it and it's been okay at the end of the day, but you never know what somebody's going through. So that's just, that's such a great example. Both of those of being like, it can't, there are certain tables that can have that. It is your job and your duty as a dungeon master to help begin those discussions. It really is. I really agree. And holding that space for people is, again, part of because you are in this like head of the table position, mm -hmm. you're trying to hold that space for people as much as possible. Because, uh, uh, you know, I think we've said this on the podcast before, but moments of charged emotion are going to come up mm -hmm. because you wouldn't be enjoying this if you didn't care. And caring means that there are strong emotions attached to things. Mm -hmm. And it's not about never having those moments of like, oh, an expectation wasn't met or a need wasn't met. Those are going to occur even in the healthiest groups of friends. It's about how do we address it when it inevitably comes up? Yes. Do we address it in a healthy way? Yeah. Um, uh, 
Kelly, we've we are we're like flying time wise. Oh. I just looked up at the clock and was like, huh, so we got to get to questions. We have oh, audience. Yes. Oh, we don't. Yes, questions. Go. Ah, we have questions. Come at me and I'll bat him. <laughs> 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 um, uh, here's a great one. Uh, 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 this is uh, this one is from Claudia Art Deco. Thanks, Claudia Art Deco. Um, uh, where do you draw your fantasy inspiration as a D and D player or writer? Do you have any must reads? Ooh, that's such a good question. Must reads. I really like some of the Forgotten Realms books that you can get that have existed for some time. You can just Google them. They're around. Uh, some of the Drizzt stuff. Like you, there's just there's a trove of fun fantasy within the D and D space that I think, even if you don't play within Forgotten Realms or even if you play a different TTRPG, you learning that and seeing people tell the story uh, book form wise or even you know graphic novel wise or um uh comic book wise it's very exciting and i've gotten a lot of resources and inspiration from those um in terms of other material i do a very interesting thing when i watch and consume almost anything like television films books whatever it may be musicals i i watch it and then i think to myself what do i like and what do i enjoy about this and i think that's where a lot of my storytelling comes from which is sort of like well that was exciting what do i like about it and then i maybe just let that thought exist in my head and i don't think on it too much and then one day down the road when you're making notes or trying to come up with the world you said you say like oh i really want to do a mushroom kingdom ah huh, that came from somewhere don't remember where, but this is my version of it. And then you just create it, you know? <laughs> and and just feeling that and having those thoughts percolate and not putting too much pressure on yourself, I think it's where, especially if you're home brewing, that's where really great ideas and worlds can come from. I I think that's that is wonderful. Especially like looking at the old there's two things I want to say in reaction to that that I think number one, um, I love like going back and looking at the old Forgotten Realms stuff, looking at the old. Oh, so good. I was a huge, me and my brother were obsessed with the Planescape setting. Tony DiTerlizzi did the art for it. You guys might know Tony DiTerlizzi's art. For, he also illustrated the Spiderwick Chronicles books. He's an incredible, incredible artist. And the books were just so well designed. And one of the things I loved about those books too, that I have wanted to bring back in a big way, is like a huge percentage of those books the information about the setting was diegetic to characters from the world. So you had this fun of everybody's an unreliable narrator. So like, <laughs> this is a description of the upper plains of Mount Celestia and Arborea yeah. given by a demon. So it's like, there's a shining silvery sea, burns you terribly, <laughs> awful, stay away. And you're like, you're like <laughs> this is beautiful. And I just love that world building of like diegetic world building. So it's sort of like, it's like, we're not giving you any ex cathedra authorial, here's what the world is like. You'll determine from what people in the world have to say about it. Um, which is so fun. But I think that within that, um, uh, if you're a beginning dungeon master, one thing I like hearing you say, like go back to the Forgotten Realms, go back and look at those old Dritz stuff, the Dragonlance novels. I remember oh, how- Oh yeah, those, oh my goodness, yes. Um, is like, you go back and look at those. When you're starting a game for the first time, I have this this thing, cause I've been doing Dimension 20, which are all these like sort of comedic, <laughs> you know, world swap, mishmash, mix them up kind of, kind of settings that when I start a game, I've just built up a tolerance to to like classic high fantasy. So yeah. I'll sit down with new players and be like, so what do we want to do? Do we want to do like spell jammer ships, but everybody's, you know, it's like 1980s and we're all drug dealers, but it's in the underdark. Do we want to do this like... <laughs> And people, if you're playing with new players, someone maybe has never gotten to be a fairy princess or has never gotten to be a dwarven warhammer guy. And you're like, maybe they've w wanted their whole life to just be that. And this is an okay thing to like let them do. Um, <laughs> even if you're on some next level world building tip. Um, uh, and I think the other thing too there is like, like you're saying, getting your inspiration from anywhere is, is so fun. And again, like there is so much of creativity, which is here's an archetype I love. How do I put my spin on it? Right? Yes. Yes. A hundred percent. 
Like, what's your mushroom kingdom? Um, uh, how are you going to do elves? Or are you going to do them in a way that they've never been done before? Right. Um, you know, there are these ideas that you can go back and revisit and go like, what is my take on them? Um, and I think that that's a, you are, when you're building the world, even if it's your very first time, you are the authority at the table. And if there's something like, uh, you can take from the canon, but I think you should never be working for the canon. Like once, mm-hmm. take mm-hmm. exactly what you want to take and then make it your own because it's just going to exist there at the table with you and your friends. Exactly. It's tools. It's tools to use. So use them, but don't rely on them. Definitely yes. build from yourself and your own. you'll get so much more out of it if you start there. A hundred percent. This next one, uh is from aiden thank you aiden um uh aiden asks uh, i'm a librarian who loves tabletop and bringing gaming to patrons uh but jamming for folks who don't know each other is a different beast any tips for bonding kids together to reduce player to player strife and promote teamwork love y'all so much oh uh, well thanks aiden and um yeah that uh, uh when you <laughs> i'm really flashing back to that 14 person table um yeah. Uh, yeah, like, um, how often have you played with, like, playing with people for the first time? Or in some cases, like, you're talking with Girls Guts Glory, it's like a pre-existing group, and you are the person who's walking in, introducing yourself for the first time. What are some tips for, like, bringing people that haven't played together into the collaborative spirit of the game? I really enjoy that good session zero, which is less about... Yes, like just it's just less about the 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 story at first and a little bit more about okay, so who and what we are who and what are we within this world to one another and how do we meet each other and where where does our where do our stories come from, you know? Some people can just start playing with a motive and you can start with module like, you know, pre-existing modules and you can use a lot of those um uh, prompts as a means to kind of find the ties, but they do at times still feel like individualistic ties and I still think there's an important element to create the layers within your party dynamics. So, no matter what, especially if you don't have time or if you're just playing like a quick game I think making or establishing some people as best friends, as sisters, cousins, um, uh, co-workers, just starting to talk a little bit about that and create bonds and talk about, okay, so how did you know each other? Let's talk about one latch memory you guys have that you always make fun of that nobody else is privy to. And so you can kind of exercise that and use that as a way to create a healthier party dynamic for younger kids. Um, I also feel that as a young kid, you know, they get very excited and, you know, it's kind of like a fairy in that, you know, they can, fairies have one emotion and they just like sometimes want to like do the one emotion. Um, uh, that good old prefrontal cortex. Um, so, I, so I think that um, y- also using a session zero as a means to begin sort of like a fun, not too high stakes where they have to all do something together to fight something some sort of threat so really thinking about what sort of enemy or situation can I introduce that would help get them all on the same page and require each one of their effort each one of their efforts to um get this enemy out of the way in whatever sort of way I I think either one of those directions is a is a smart move especially if you're strapped on time and working with younger kids I think that is so profoundly helpful I, you know, there's this funny thing because for myself, I can clock in myself, even I've, you know, I've been DMing since I was a 10 year old kid. Even to this day, I'm like, man, Brendan, you do that a lot. And that's not great. <laughs> Moments where I'm like, look at these little foibles you keep making. You keep doing this thing. Why do you keep doing that? And one of them is I always, there's a part of me that's like, you know what? No, like, I, like every, anyone can make whatever character they want to make. And I will find a way to like water slide all of you into being best buddies. It's like, it's mm-hmm. like a challenge. It's like, I got to do it. I just, uh, a friend of mine, Michael Saltzman, who's a a writer for Um Unactually, a question writer for Um Unactually, who's an awesome, awesome guy, great dungeon master, recently was just like, hey, I'm thinking about starting up a campaign. Um, And I was like, cool, I I would love to play and not have to DM. Um, And he was like, great, you're all mercenaries. Uh, You guys came up with why you joined this mercenary company. It's your first day working for the mercenary company. And I just went, 
oh my god, that makes everything so easy. (laughs) What a simple prompt, right? (laughs) What a simple prompt. And there was no part of me that was like, but what about my character vision? I was, there was no part of me that rankled at that. And I immediately was like, Brennan, you could totally just do that. Especially if you're like a librarian, you're running a game, you're strapped for time. You can go to your players and go, hey, you all get along and work together. Within that parameter, what do you want to do now? And it can be it can be as concrete as like you are literally co-workers, <laughs> or you can come in, I think, and just have that thing of um putting putting your thumb on the scale during character creation. It is not tyrannical. You are not putting a burden on anybody to go hey, I am seeing in your character creation that you are making a character that is very antagonistic towards others. Mm -hmm. In order for, uh, like, I won't even disallow this, but why does your character make an excuse for these four other people? Because you do have to like them. Like, it is okay Mm -hmm. to put those parameters on things, um, especially when you're playing with kids. Especially, Um, yeah. (laughs) Um, uh, yeah, having having interparty conflict can work, but that's like a tremendous amount of trust that has to exist between the real human beings at the table to make interparty conflict work. Exactly, it works a little bit further down the line once all that trust is really there. Exactly, hundred percent agree. <laughs> uh, hell yeah. Uh, the one thing I'll bring up too is I'll say even if you have a lot of trust, the t- there's also the one little caveat I like to give, which is. Um, uh, occasionally, if you get to a level of trust where you are like family to each other, sometimes you get to a point where you're like, well, we're like family, so we don't have to check in. We're like, I know these people like the back of my hand. And it's one of those things where it's like, actually, even with those people every once in a while, check in. I remember doing an improv show in New York with uh, my like oldest and most beloved indie group. And we did a, sh- a show after like not performing for a year and a half. And we were like slapping each other in the face for tag outs. We were just like doing, people would initiate a scene and we would be like, what? No. And we were cracking ourselves up, but we were like, we maybe trust each other so much that it has manifested in not treating each other well. (laughs) (laughs) Moment of reflection. (laughs) Moment of reflection. So even for for people that you love dearly, like family, make sure that you, or family itself, make sure that you're still checking in. Um, uh, uh, This is a, let's see, we got some other... um, uh, oh, so this is this is actually one that's sort of interesting that, that relates back to, Kelly, you were talking about before in your early days of D&D. Um, uh, this one's from Katie L. Um, I'm a new college student. Uh, stu- I'm a new college student attending a private religious college. I really enjoy watching D&D actual plays, but I haven't played in a campaign myself before. And I'm a little nervous about how D&D will be received at this new school. How do I try to find a group to play with while also navigating, making new friends, and adjusting to college? Thanks, KDL. Um, yeah, this relates back to some of the stuff we were talking about in terms of like, now we're in this naissance, we're in this big time where D&D is, is having this big moment. Um, but I remember I was playing back in the day, my mom, uh, you know, like there was like satanic panic. Yes stuff back in the day those like jack chick tracts of like the little comics and stuff like that um it's i think the attitudes even in religious circles have somewhat shifted in this day and age but is there i'm trying to think of like uh, good advice for finding a group like back in those days when you had that dungeon master come up to you and be like mm-hmm. hey kelly it seems <laughs> like you um, yeah, like how how do you find? And I think this more broadly, like how do you find a group? Um, um, I would, yeah, it's an interesting question. I would say that even if you are looking for an in person group, the internet is still your friend. Um, like, yeah, it, exactly that. It's the internet, or starting with internet ends like whispering the internet ins around campus saying like, have you seen, you know, who's seen dimension 20? And they'll be like, what is that? And I'm like, Oh, well, thanks for, thanks for asking. Let me tell you about it. You know, <laughs> like that. Yeah. That's, and the hair, the hair is a signal. The hair yes. is definitely a signal as you're like getting those little keys across. There is that kind of speakeasy element about it. Um, and again, but I also think that that is, 
whether you are being careful because you there's like a cultural element in the place where you are, whether you're at a religious institution, you're just in a you're like maybe you're in a small town where the attitude is maybe not as cosmopolitan, whatever it is, I actually think that even easy, it's a big deal to ask someone to join your D and D group. I feel like because you're like, hey, do you want to commit to hanging out biweekly for the next you know however long? I think that you can broach those things gingerly, like you're saying, like startup conversations about nerd adjacent, D&D adjacent things. Um, And again, I think a lot of, even if you're like, I am interested in doing this at my college, um, is there a student group? Is there a a group that you guys belong to, be it a Facebook thing, an email chain, whatever, like, um, looking for those like fellow travelers around you that are engaging in the same sort of media consumption that you are. And I think broaching it gingerly is an okay thing to do um, within those contexts. Um, but I would also say, look around because like, if, especially if you've just joined this institution, there may be groups that are like pre-existing here that you don't know about. I would like do a little snooping around in those spaces to find like-minded individuals. You might even find them at your local game store when and if the game store is reopened and people can actually interact then. that Until then, I would recommend doing online stuff, but that is where a lot of people prior to having to move to more digital spaces were also finding folks. So. I- that's a great piece of advice. And also remember that your LGS probably has an online portal or avatar. It may have a little Facebook group. It may have something else like that. Um, I don't know if I'm dating myself terribly by mentioning Facebook all these times. <laughs> all, the, all our Gen Z fans are like, Facebook, what the hell are you talking Neo about? Neopets. Anyway. <laughs> Mine's called Little Sparky Spa- Star. <laughs> I want the Neopet, uh, what's it called? Stock Market. And I was a rich Neopetian. I'll stop there. I, I will die. I had no friends again. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, truly. So in the, in the animation world, I remember Molly Ostertag, who is a friend of mine, uh, talks about Neopets. She was like, man, back in the day, it was all about Neopets. That was the thing. Uh, for me, it was Pogs. That was what I was into before D&D. What a, what a glow up. Um, Love indeed. <laughs> um, uh, we got some great other questions here. Um, I uh, wanted to talk about this. Uh, this one's from Eric J. Zavadsky. Thanks, Eric. Um, how much involvement should a DM have when players build their PCs, e.g. to help background and party cohesion, which we talked about a little bit just a moment ago. But I also want to ask Kelly this question in the context of starting up a campaign with a bunch of people who are incredible performers and creators, but are totally new to the game. Um, uh, uh, what, what are your go-tos for helping when you're like, okay, these people know how to perform, they understand character, they understand media. Like, how do you break down character creation for players like that? I will equate it to walking down a large grocery store cereal aisle. Sometimes less is more. Um, (laughs) When you're walking down an aisle, do you want to be overwhelmed with every flavor in every single brand with all different sort of, you know, gluten-free options? This, Or do you want to have a more narrow selection with people's chance to ruminate on the more narrow selections and then going from there? Don't be afraid to start a little bit more narrow with newer players so they can feel comfortable having a choice within that world and within that space, but not throwing in so much that it becomes overwhelming. I would say that's a good place to start. I think that's awesome. And I think too, one of the things with character creation is it can feel like a slog at times. It's something you want to race through to like get the, like, okay, we only have three hours. Let's get all these characters done. Uh, I think that there's also something very joyful to taking the time and especially to explaining what things mean. Yes. Like, especially if you've been playing for a long time, you're, you're, you know, an old hand at the game. There's a thing about like, great, so you get a feat. So what kind of feat do you want? Here's some feats. And you're like, what the fuck is a feat? Like, (laughs) you have to, you really have to take it with every time you have to be like, okay, your character will be able to choose a really awesome ability from these list of abilities that 
are is a real way to customize it because it's not attached to being a wizard necessarily. It's unrelated to the magic and stuff that you do. It's its own ability, its own right. Really spelling stuff out. And I think too, um, it's it's one of those funny things that I think for a lot of people, especially like in your case, you're working with people that know storytelling front to back. Mm-hmm. One of the things that I like to to explain is like, okay. Yes, this is a mechanical choice. You're, it has to do with numbers and crunch, and it's in the character sheet, yada, yada. Mm-hmm. Here's the impact it will have on the story. Like, I remember a long time ago, there was a, a person, a friend of mine, made this character that was really unoptimized. It was like... <laughs> a paladin with almost no strength and they they had all this other stuff. And it's like, no, I don't want armor. They're just wearing a tunic and all this stuff. And then first fight, they get demolished. And the person (laughs) is looking there crestfallen, like what happened? And I was like, well, your character, lovely though they are, got absolutely walloped from a series of disadvantageous choices. And the person went like, but, they're the plucky hero. And I had to have this heartbreaking thing of being like, Aww. in a fairy tale, pluck is very real. If we want your character to be plucky, we have to create that mechanically. You're probably gonna have to take the lucky feat. Mm-hmm. You're gonna have to do this mm-hmm. other, like, no, and, and having that moment as a DM where you go, I am always going to emphasize story over mechanics. Yes. However, the mechanics do affect the story. It's okay to make an unoptimized character, but you need to reckon with the fact that this character, when combat comes around, is going to get creamed. If that's fun for you, and we all agreed that's what should happen, that's great. But if you want your character to, character to succeed more than they fail, yes. Mm-hmm. For story reasons, like my character is competent, my character is a hero of the realm or whatever, we need to get the dice on our side, right? This, I feel yeah. very much like, like a good cop right now of like, look, I want to help you, kid, but these dice over here, they're, they're Yeah, you sound exactly like that. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't want to be the bad cop, though. I'm actually, this just good cop, good cop. It's me just being like, yeah, mate, good yeah. job. Keep going. Yeah, for sure. Um, <laughs> But I think that there's that moment when you're helping someone through character creation of explaining what certain choices are going to mean, right? Also, you know, especially if you're starting new with new players, uh, not being afraid to start them at level one if they're not familiar with the game because they're going to have a lot of choices <laughs> moving mm-hmm. forward. And as they build and level up, instead of starting them at like level three or level five, I think it's really not a bad thing to start at level one and go slower if they're newer. and let them understand the mechanics of it. Now, if you're playing with a, you know, season vets, you can kind of go in a little bit older or a little bit more, you know, rough and t- uh, rough around the edges and maybe bring them up more levels. But character creation is probably the most important thing yeah. uh, for your players, not your story, not the other things. It's like character creation because that's what it's about. Yeah, exactly. And it's those choices, you know, I, I think a lot about I've been running a, a home game for 11 years and thank you. Um, just had a whole. I'm big... throwing the bears and the flowers back at you for my mental <laughs> yes! game yes, Thank sh- you. Sh- thank you. Yeah. Yes. Um, <laughs> but there's this there's this incredible thing where I, occasionally it hits me. I'm like, we had a character creation session that lasted about like two hours. And if you had gone to any of those people back in the day, because we didn't, you don't start a game thinking this is going to last for eleven years. No. But just the idea that somebody was like was like i'm either going to be this character or this like this other like the idea that there was a choice made in the moment on that one afternoon 11 years ago that those players stuck with for 11 years so like it's i don't want to put too much pressure on it but yeah it's significant you might be playing this character for a while um <laughs> like uh, you know, make sure that you're that you're you're uh, uh, you know pl- making choices that will potentially over a long period of time that will bring joy to you. Exactly. Um, um, there's another question here. We have I think we have time for probably one or two more. Um, you're on my way. I'm going. <laughs> I like. I'm imagining I have a beautiful sword in my hands and I'm cutting the apples as they come at me. 
Uh, that is true joy. Uh, cutting <laughs> fruit with a sword is true. Uh, uh, and then I'm catching it in my mouth and eating it quickly. It's not It's not cool at all because like, I just cut it and I'm just eating food, <laughs> chomping on it vigorously. Uh, it, amazing. Beautiful. Uh, surpri- uh, surprising absolutely no one uh, in the, the, the my, my like a, apartment in New York where we had this, we played this big D&D group for a long, long time. The last apartment I lived in before we moved to uh, Los Angeles, we christened the apartment with uh, fruit chopping with a sword great. Uh, uh, beautiful great. chopped a cantaloupe why would, you, why would you do you have to be doing that in every apartment you move into everybody it's incredible it. yeah the swords <laughs> don't need to be that sharp to really chop fruit in your head you're thinking like no way can i chop a fruit you can chop a fruit you can do it you can, you do, can it. do it i believe uh, <laughs> Uh, this next question comes to us from Marshall Timmermans. Thanks, Marshall. Um, I'm putting together my first campaign as a DM, and I'm trying to convince my non-D&D playing friends to join in. Any advice on how to convince non-players to give the game a try for the first time? And what can I do as a DM to make the experience as fun as possible? Um, yes. The how does one uh, go about, like, selling the game because this is there's there is a obviously if someone doesn't want to play that is their business and all the best to them uh and their choices and not wanting to play however there i think there is definitely like you're saying for a lot of people i have always been very shocked uh, in my life and especially prior to this big moment where now there's like actual play shows and people know D and D is and people there's write ups about D and D all the time. But I would always be surprised at the demographics of who would say yes and no to an invitation right away. I remember going to SVA and uh, for, for screenwriting in New York. And there were a bunch of really cool kids. One kid had like a tattoo of a reel of film, safety pins, like like dark Whoa. hair, tattoos, nose piercing, these sort of like goth, hipster, rocker dudes. They were in a class one time and they overheard me talking about D&D. And they came over and they were like, they were like smoking outside. They were like, you play D&D? And it was like, yeah. yeah, like, are you? Is this a? Am I in trouble? Yeah. I was also, I should say, I went. I was very young when I went to this college, so I was like seventeen years old. Oh. And I was like, yeah, and they were like, "That's fucking sick as hell." We, <laughs> I always wanted to play. How do you? Like, how do you play? Could we play? Um, uh, but other people definitely will cop a vibe around it of like, "Ooh, D and D's not for me." There's some part of it, you know, like. Um, and I think there's a difference between like, hey, I am as a, as an adult human being, I'm telling you I don't want to play versus someone being like, oh, I could never do that because you have to be good at math. And you then have an opportunity to be like, actually, that part of it really isn't the most, you know, um, uh, have, have you ever had to give somebody the hard sell on it or no? There has been one or two times where someone says, I don't think I could ever play that. And I'm, I'm try- I was trying to understand what they meant by that. Because I was like, but you're such a good actor. You're such a good storyteller or this or that. Or you love board games or like, or that, you know, I was trying to understand why they had interest at least a little bit within little spaces of storytelling and world building and why they were so um, like, oh, I could never with D&D. And I think it was a mixture of, of not knowing exactly what D&D was, as well as intimidation. I think that some people get a little intimidated by D&D because there is this sort of like, oh my gosh, the rules. Oh my gosh, there's so much to learn. Uh, I feel out of my element. I'm not going to be good at it. I'm not Mm going to be good at D&D. Nobody is good and nobody is bad. Like like D&D is what you make it. and that's where if you can talk some people and help them understand, like, no, 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 no. don't be afraid of being good at D&D. Just the idea is to have fun. So, yes, I'll guide you through some of the mechanics, but you can forget all of those because really what's going to happen is you'll learn it as we play. And, yes, there'll be a lot of cl- clarification about what we need in the first few gameplays, but you'll get the hang of it after long, like after a short period of time. So, yeah. so kind of going in on, with that angle, I think, would help newcomers especially if that's sort of what they're saying 
Yeah, I think that's exactly right. And there's no point in like, well, I, I think too, there's again, because I also always want to be careful of like, if someone has told you they don't want to play, then they don't want to play. they don't, yes. Um, <laughs> but I think that there really is this thing of, that one thing you can acknowledge when you are inviting someone to come play with you is the degree to which a lot of people make determinations based on their idea of what something is. And D&D is one of those things where if you haven't played it, you probably don't know what it really is. And that's not everything is like that. You know, if you, there are things that you can have not, if you like, I'm trying to give an example. Okay, if you see someone jumping off a big tall rock into the water, you can look at that and be like, I think I have some idea of what that experience would be like. <laughs> yes. Like, I've seen it from beginning to end and I understand sort of the principles of the physics involved. But a lot of people's idea of Dungeons and Dragons comes from, you know, a reference on a sitcom or, you know, some something taken from somewhere else. And if you explain it to them as like, hey, mostly this is going to be us sitting around a table on a comfy sofa, eating chips and hanging out. Yes. <laughs> That's going to be like 80% of what this is going to be. And then on top of that, we're going to be doing improv. We're going to be kind of collaboratively doing like an improv storytelling thing. And at moments of high stakes, we're going to roll these little dice that are going to make a decision about what happens. And you do that and someone goes like, oh, I thought this is, was competitive, or I thought this was that. So I would say, like you're saying, the, the best way you can convince someone to play is not really to like convince them to play, but I think rather go and be like, if you are under a mistaken assumption, here's what the game really is. Here's exactly. really what's expected of you. Um, and then after that, if you're still not into it, groovy. But if it's cleared up some misconceptions about what is actually expected of people and you go like, oh, that actually does sound way more doable, then please come play because uh, this game slaps and it's very fun. Um, uh, I love that. I think we got time for one last one. Here. One last one. The one? penultimate question. No, I'm just kidding. You're uh, all great well. questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I love it. Um, uh, so, the, ooh, this is a, this is a great one. Um, uh, so, uh, this one's from Gus Rachels. Thanks, Gus. Uh, have you ever run slash played in a campaign where the party lost in the end? As a DM, do you have a contingency plan to make a TPK in a finale session not feel like losing the Super Bowl? Um, uh, this is an incredible mm -hmm. question. And I think, bro first of all, um, I will just answer and say, I have never had a full TPK end a campaign. Um, the closest I've ever come is have all the PCs truly lose a combat where five out of six of them were captured and the last one managed to escape, right? But I think there's a broader question here too. And I do want to answer Gus's specific question of what I think you should do, even though I've never gone through that personally. But I think that this is one of the biggest questions that a DM has to handle, which is um, how do you handle disappointment, failure, or a character just not getting what they wanted or what they thought they wanted? That is, that is so hard because I think that that at initially, depending on the environment, it can really change a mood. Yeah. I will give an incredible example. <gasps> there was a very, very, very big showdown with a very big situation with <laughs> lower level characters wading into territories that I constantly was trying to warn them not to go towards <laughs> um, for a very long time with a, in a fire temple. And this was our our game right before Christmas break. So mm -hmm. everyone was like like excited, but like there was a lot in the air and people needed like a good game to like end the year to like bring us into the new year. And we're playing and one by one by one, they're dying. <laughs> and you could see the energy of the room just like deflate. And I said, 
like, what do you have in your packs? Like, like I'll prompt them. Like, as a DM, I'll be like, look through your stuff. What do you have? What do you have? What do you have? And one of them realized they had, like, a special whistle <laughs> to help summon an old friend that they didn't think they were going to have to use. But they were in a desperate situation, and they had to use it. Mm-hmm. It ended up saving their lives, as well as a D100 roll that just so happened to hit the percentile needed to evoke one of their gods. And it was probably the most intense like intense session, not just because of the session, but because of the time of year and the situation where everyone was just not did not want to end the year on that note. That was sort of like the moment. And they're all amazing players and people, but it's just how the dice were rolling and mm-hmm. how the choices were made were. Um and as that was happening, we were so relieved after they were so relieved afterward that it didn't end up the way it was going because they said it looked like there was literally no option. We were all going to die and that was going to be the end. And I said, that's never the end. Like, it's not. Even if that had happened, we might have been def- you might have felt defeated, but that's just a place to go for more story. It yeah. doesn't mean that the story is over. I once ran the death house with brand new players who are all executives in LA. I don't think that was a good idea. Don't do that (laughs) for people who could hire you, but I ran the death house and (laughs) should have read the actual people who be careful running death house, but I ran it. And of course the first time we all played, they all died, but because they all died in a death house, I modified the story because they were new players to not make it feel defeating. And I said, you're now all ghosts within the death house and you have to find your corporeal bodies intact. But if you die within corporeal oh. form, you're, you vanquish. So like, like it ended up building the second life, but higher stakes. And now they understood the mistakes they made and they, they were so scared on stepping on every floorboard moving forward, but it ended up giving more story and it made it an even richer story because of the liberties I took as a DM to be like, wow, that feels a certain way. I don't want us to feel this way, but I want us to learn from it and use it as a story. So, you know, use, use it as a story. God, that's so good. That is the, so that ghost fix, did you come up with that at the table? Yeah, I was just there, and I was like, let's do it. Oh, what a slick move. Oh, my God. That is, like, talk about qu- quick thinking in terms of, like, having a moment where you – and I think that's, that's always what it is. It's, like, that is, like, the storyteller instinct of, like, okay, what next? Like, no, 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 it's not over. Not over. What next? What next? Like, Which is curious also for someone saying, okay, how do we end our campaign on the – this is it moment. Like yeah. a TPK, this is it. If they're all dying for a greater cause, that's awesome. That's great. Do an epilogue. Yeah. Do an epilogue. Have have the respect to give your players that epilogue so they know though their characters died, the world continued on and their sacrifice was not in vain. That's important. You can still do it. You can still make it beautiful, you know? Well, that's so, I think that's so true. And that's something beautiful too, because the, like in reality, the thing that most separates like the world from stories. And like, we have this thing where we use stories to understand the world. We use stories to talk about ourselves and our place in the world and what we think about the world, what we think about ourselves and all these things. But the idea of the biggest difference of course is in the, in reality, there are no beginnings or endings. We are born into the middle and we will pass one day and it will still be the middle, right? Like we are participating in this large ongoing thing. And like, so when you're storytelling, you are always picking your beginning and ending, Mm -hmm. which is not to say that your beginning and ending aren't incredibly significant, but they really are arbitrary. Like, in Fantasia, in the world of imagination, those characters keep living after we say happily ever after, right? Yes. What a what a kind of incredibly <laughs> convenient cop out, and like and happily ever after, <laughs> and you go, it's it's done now. We stop the story now, right? Um, but but like you're saying, like um, 
like in if we can imagine the fictional world as a reality in all likelihood the pendulum keeps swinging the ups and downs keep going it's like sort of that that beautiful zen fable about you know something bad happens the zen master says was it bad we'll see something good happens exactly. the says, we'll see right um exactly. really so so your endings are all about again like where you choose to edit where you choose to go this is where the story comes to a conclusion um when you're dealing with something like a TPK, I think something like Kelly, what Kelly said about those ghosts coming back is huge, right? In D and D cosmology, the afterlife is incredibly real, and there yes. are stakes in the beyond, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I think too, coming back, you uh, uh, or if you have that TPK, you eat, like, can you provide significance, right? Is there something to that where you say, okay, yes, this is an end for these characters, but as we all know, the story is larger than that. Um, I think that's really what it comes down to is the feeling of mournfulness and defeat. So sorrow and tragedy are cathartic feelings. Yes, like, yes. Is cathartic. These things can be cathartic. What you want to avoid is the feeling of this happened and it didn't matter and there's no catharsis behind it. So I think you can go to these places of deep sorrow as long as you are prepared either to improvise something or you have something planned to go, yes, this is a moment of great defeat. However, mm -hmm. again, like that Zen master. Story goes on. Story yep. goes on. Wait and see, right? Yep. <sighs> um, gang, 90 minutes. Snaps. Just story snaps. Story snaps story all snaps. around. Um, <laughs> Kelly, this has been like, the, the the time just flew by. This has been such joy and such an honor to have you. Um, I feel the same. Thank you for having me, Brennan. It's so lovely. <laughs> oh, my gosh. A truly a joy. And I feel like there's so much incredible, useful gems of practical tactical just put it right into your game advice that we had over the course of the hour uh kelly lindangelo thank you so much everyone go check out kelly's stream when it comes out and dnd go check it out yay thanks. see you guys next time bye bye, bye.